most of our errors in judgment, and a weakness, fallacy, and mistake of our argumentation proceed from the confusion, defect, lack, or some other regularity in our conceptions. In our pursuit and acquiring of ideas, caution and special rules should be used in our conception of things. Two major sources of confusion in our ideas are, number one, since the time we were born, we've had the idea of things so far connected with the idea of words that we often mistake words for things. We mingle and, and confuse the one with the other. Words are not things. Secondly, from our younger years, we have been ever ready to consider things, not so much in their own natures as in their various respect to ourselves and chiefly to our senses, how we perceive things. We often end up judging things with our perceptions instead of with a true perception. We should gain clear and distinct ideas. We should not be content with obscure and confused ideas when clearer ideas can be obtained. One danger, though, is to spend too much time and pains among infinites and unsearchables, and those things which we do not have the means to find out in our current state. We must distinguish and define our subject and sense of words. We must contemplate and distinguish the subject that we have in view from all other subjects whatsoever. We must give a definition of the name, which is the sense of our words. What do I mean when I say such and such? When we give the sense of a word, we can also use synonymous words, or a translation of the word into another language, or a grammatical explanation of it. Some directions concerning the definition of names. Do not be satisfied with mere words that do not have any ideas belonging to them, or at least no settled and determinate and clear ideas. Do not use empty words, whether you are a learner or a teacher. 1 Timothy 1, 4, 6 through 8 says, Neither give heed to fables and endless genealogies, which minister questions rather than godly edifying, which is in faith, so do. From which some, having swerved, have turned aside unto vain jangling, desiring to be teachers of the law, understanding neither what they say, neither whereof they affirm. But we know that the law is good if a man use it lawfully. Second Peter 2, 18-19 says, For when they speak great swelling words of vanity, they allure through the lusts of the flesh, through much wantonness, those that were clean escaped from them who live in error, while they promised them liberty, they themselves are the servants of corruption, for of whom a man is overcome, or the same as he brought in bondage. Avoid teaching words without ideas, or using vain and flowery words to give ample evidence to your ignorance of the true cause of natural appearances. The teacher may have only a library of witty words, without understanding, and the listener will have hardly an idea of what he is talking about, even though it sounds good. Romans 16.17 says, Now I beseech you, brethren, mark them which cause divisions, and offenses contrary to the doctrine which ye have learned, and avoid them. For they that are such serve not our Lord Jesus Christ, but their own belly, and by good words and fair speeches deceive the hearts of the simple. Use caution in believing that the nature and essence of two or more things to be the same just because they have the same name given to them. For example, the words life soul, heat. In conversation or reading, be diligent to find out what is the true sense or the distinct idea which the speaker or writer is using with his words, especially the words he uses with the primary subject of his discourse. For example, if he is using or talking about the subject of church, find out what the sense and the distinct idea that he is using when he says the word church. Consider what is the original and derivation in our own or foreign language of a word. Did a word have a different usage historically? Some examples would be patriotism versus nationalism, or the word democracy. The King James Bible is rich 
and words chosen specifically for their meaning. Sometimes it does us good to examine words in Webster's 1628 Dictionary, to see the sense in which a word was used near the time that the 1611 Bible was translated. What was the sense of a word as used by the general public and other authors who wrote in the same century or at the same time? Is the word used in a large and general sense, or in a limited and strict sense? Is it used in a literal, figurative, or prophetic sense? Does it have any secondary idea annexed to it besides the primary or the chief sense? What is the scope or design of the writer? What is the context of the idea? When communicating an idea to others with the intent to inform and improve their knowledge, always define and determine plainly what you mean by the chief words that are the subject of your communications. Stay consistent with those same ideas and words unless you give them notice of a change. Many disputes would have been avoided if every writer or speaker had told us at the beginning in what sense he would use those words. For example, grace, faith, righteousness, repentance, justification, worship, church, bishop, etc. In your own studies and speaking, avoid ambiguous terms as much as possible. It is the ambiguity of names, as we have often said, that brings about almost infinite confusion into our conception of things. The distinction of a name is the enumeration or the listing of the various senses of an equivocal or equal word. Dictionaries contain a listing of the distinctions of a name. In communicating your ideas, use every word as near as possible in the same sense in which mankind commonly uses it, or which writers that have gone before you have usually affixed to it, as long as it is free from ambiguity. If you are using words that are technically correct, if from Webster's Dictionary, make sure your audience is up to date with the definition and usage that you are using. 